Bet this football season with my bookie. Use promo code Gators and get a 50% match with your first deposit. Only at my bookie. Gators Breakdown. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I'm your host, David Waters, and you can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Joining you right here, giving you this Tennessee volunteer preview. Florida traveling to Knoxville, take on Tennessee at 3.30 on CBS. You know, the game's not what it used to be. Not what it used to be, of course, but... It's still a game for now that uh, Florida wins. They go win the uh, they capture the SEC East and then continue on to the uh, march to the SEC championship game. Uh, of course, everybody's pointing to that, but you got to get past these next two games. That starts with Tennessee this week. And uh, joining me to break down Tennessee will be Jason Swain. He's a Tennessee wide receiver from 2003 to 2006 and host of the Swain event. So joins us right here. Give us a really good breakdown of these Tennessee volunteers. Before we get into that breakdown, remember you can find Gators Breakdown at news4jacks.com slash Gators Breakdown. There you'll find all the Gators Breakdown episodes as well as News 4 Jacks coverage of the Gators. Please share, rate, and review the show on YouTube. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. It really helps us out here on Gators Breakdown. Or if you just want the audio version, if you're on the go, check us out on your favorite podcast platform. Follow Gators Breakdown on social media. We're on Twitter and Facebook at Gators Breakdown. I am now joined by Jason Swain, Tennessee wide receiver from 2003 to 2006 and host of the Swain event. Jason, man, I hope uh, I hope 2020 is treating you well as, as it can be. Yeah, it's been a crazy year, but uh, counting our blessings and man, that's, that's that's what you can do. You can count your blessings and be thankful for what you do have. And we do have football, that's for sure, as a college football fan, so... Uh, man, I thank you for asking. I hope you are well as, uh, as well. Yeah, yeah, going good, going good. And, of course, looking forward to this matchup here, Florida-Tennessee. And, look, I mean, Jason, when you were at Tennessee, you know, the the rivalry between the two teams wasn't quite at the level of the 90s when you played in it, but still held, you know, a whole lot of SEC East implications. And you played in some dramatic games between these two programs. What do you remember most uh, when the Gators and Vols got together with your time there? I just remember going up against NFL talent. Um, I mean, guys that that you see play on Sundays and play well on Sundays and, and be pro bowlers. Uh, you knew that, that that game was the first SC East game. And if you won that, he had a great opportunity to go to Atlanta. Um, I just remember crazy atmospheres um, whenever we went down to the swamp and crazy, you know, stadiums whenever the Gators came up and played us in the stadium. So, uh, man, certainly lost that luster for sure. Lost the shine, um, but it is a it is a game that guys like me remember um, as being, you know, hard hitting, uh, intense. Um, just never never knew what play would be the play that would determine the outcome of the game because the games were close. But it's not been that way for a while around here. Yeah, two games that come to my mind, of course, in, in your time there, two thousand four, the. Uh... You know, Dallas Baker slap, <laughs> and then Tennessee drives down, kicks a field goal, and then uh, 2006, of course, kind of Tim Tebow's coming out party. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember they got brought him in on short yard situations, and um, you know, you know, Dallas Baker is a friend, friend of mine, and you know, they always catch the second guy. So I remember <laughs> Jonathan Way you know, hit him first, and the referee catching Dallas Baker, um, and you know, them, them losing that game, I really feel bad for Dallas because they probably win that game if that didn't happen. And um, the 06 game, you know, we up two scores. You know, Chris Leakes gets 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 hit. There's an interception. Referees call a hit to the head, which was very, very, very questionable. I thought it was a terrible call. So it uh, basically um, you know, nullified a, a pick six. And – Florida scored on that possession and wound up winning 28 to 27. That was the year they won a national championship there in 06. So, man, I still think about that play, that game all the time. But that just speaks to how serious this rivalry was because, um, you know, again, it's just not that way anymore. 
Yeah, we'll get to that. You know, right now, Tennessee starting out 2-0 and to make it eight straight wins dating back to last season. And this was a, a targeted year for Tennessee to, to make that turn under Jeremy Pruitt and, and show progress and competing with Florida and Georgia in the East. And now, you know, we fast forward a little bit. Tennessee lost five straight games. What's the mindset when looking at this Tennessee team and how it probably hasn't lived up to expectations? I'll say from the fans' perspective, is what you're asking from the fans yeah, side of it? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. Yeah, man, it's just it's it's just been a uh, real disappointing year, and um, you know I can describe the fans' feelings right now uh, between two emotions. One would be you know anger. Um, the other one would be apathy, and you know I think apathy is more dangerous than than anger. Mm-hmm. Uh, to be honest, because folks have um, looked around for the last couple of years, ten years, and said, "Okay, what are like what are we doing? You know, we've been patient. Um, we have supported this football program. And, you know, we have bought into new head coaches and gave them opportunity, and uh, we've only been let down and." It's hard for Tennessee fans because you look around the league and you see Missouri at four and three and in the first year. And then you, you see Arkansas that was, you know, just atrocious the last couple of years. Not even winning an SEC football game for a while. And now, you know, you get beat by them um, you know, pretty pretty convincingly, you know, twenty four points, you know, unanswered against against Arkansas. And that was a game you looked at the schedule and felt like that would be a win for you. But you lose that game, you lose for the first time at home against Kentucky in decades. And so, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just not a positive time around here at Rocky Top, to be honest, man. It's, 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 been a rare, it's been a really tough three to four weeks. And I've been here doing what I'm doing during the doing, doing Dooley days, during the Bush Jones days. And I can say that this is quite different. Um, and it's tough right now to be doing radio and TV because uh, it's, it's doom and gloom around here for sure. And you got COVID, guys being out because of contact tracing. So, uh, man, we've seen some teams able to maneuver through uh, these times. We've seen, you know, we see Alabama, we see Florida, we see A&M. You know, they're able to maneuver around these times. They have good players, good coaches. But you see other teams that don't have quite that talent, and uh, they're struggling. And Tennessee is one of those teams. Uh, let's get to you know Jeremy Pruitt here uh, a bit. You know, two SEC East coaches already fired this season with Mason and Muschamp. And I, from far away, I don't see Tennessee doing anything. And maybe I'm just kind of looking at it on the surface, you know, because the extension right, right before the season. Uh, is there any confidence in him getting it turned around? Is is this game against Florida at all a a measuring stick? with how this season has went so far? No, I don't think it's a measuring stick. I think we pretty much know what this what this team is going to be. I mean, this this team is going to be a team that possibly only wins three games. Um, and you just wouldn't have thought that this time last year when Tennessee was right in the middle of a winning streak and finished the season strong going up against Indiana. And Indiana's a team this year that, you know, they're, they're doing very well. Um, for, as far as Coach Pruitt, you know, you look at Will Muschamp, you look at Derek Mason, those guys let go this year. Derek Mason was, was there six, seven years. Uh, Muschamp, five, six years, somewhere around there. But Pruitt's in his third season, and um, it, it doesn't look good, uh, quite frankly. Usually you see a coach in his third year kind of show you what they can do in a program, but I don't think Tennessee is in any position to be making any changes right now because of – the financial hit that every institution in America has taken. So uh, athletics, you're still playing Butch Jones, a buyout until the beginning of next year. Um, I think Tennessee's kind of stuck. Unless you just totally lay down against Florida, lay down against Texas A&M, and you lose the Vanderbilt, then Tennessee may be forced to do something. But I just I just don't see that happening unless we see those um, circumstances play out. And you kind of mentioned the apathy before. I mean – of course, we'll have to let this year play out and, and, and see how mm-hmm. it goes. Is there, I guess, any confidence? I mean, you know, there, there there was a recruiting uptick over the summer for Tennessee, and maybe lost a couple commits this week, but still, you know, mm-hmm. a pretty good base for the class, you know, to finish out till we get to February. Is there any confidence mm-hmm. that that Pruitt can be the guy to turn it around, or is it just kind of uh, the fan base maybe feeling a lost cause at this point? 
Man, I, I think, you know, just one of whatever I've seen and heard, I mean, I think I think fans are really tapped out. Um, I mean, on my show today, I man, it's Tennessee Florida week. We always talk about, yeah. you know, this game. And, man, we talked about doing a pickup basketball game for an hour. You know, a fan pickup basketball game. That's what we talked about uh, on, on my program. I mean, it, it, just to try to stay away from the toxic conversations and, and you know, talking about what, coach should Tennessee go and talk to next. I mean, we still have a coach, but right. people are already talking about Hugh Freeze and, and it's just, it is really toxic. You had a player yesterday, uh, be dismissed. I mean, um, for, for, you know, gun and, and drug charges. And so it's just, it's just not a good time, uh, at all. And of course, you know, it's easy to pile that on Peru, even though a young man making that decision is, is, is not an indication of, of the coaching job right. someone is doing. I've seen, you know, good coaches that run clean programs have a player that, you know, decide to do something stupid. Um, but it just kind of adds to the fire here. And so um, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see here a lot of optimism from fans about whether Coach Pruitt can get it done. Uh, and I think when you look around the league and see some of the other first-year coaches be successful, that, that's what hurts Pruitt and the optimism that he can turn it around. So um, a big win, hopefully, will – will change that for some fans. Um, but it's going to take some more than just one big win. It's going to take, you know, the quarterback position being a whole lot better. I mean, I think the lack of development there, you know, what Jerry Gantano has, has not been able to do um, in his time being a starting quarterback since 2017, uh, man, it's, it's really worn fans. Yeah, and before we get right there, let's take a look, you know, at the game in particular. We, we've seen – I uh, am reports this week of some guys maybe missing practice, but maybe being available for the game Saturday. Do you have any indication of who those players are or who can we, who can we expect to be out there or not out there uh, when Tennessee and, and Florida play Saturday? Yeah. I mean, Pruitt's talked to the media, I mean, it's been, it's been out there. I mean, Tennessee is not going, they're not going to see, um, you know, Jerry Gantano out there because of contact tracing, contact tracing, you know, you're going to, Miss a um, starting linebacker. You're gonna miss some DBs out there. Um, you know, Lante Taylor looks like Henry Toto, Toto, guys like that. Uh, so it looks like Tennessee will, will be starting a true freshman to Harrison Bailey. And um, the good thing is, I've watched I watched Florida's defense, and they don't necessarily scare me. But Florida's offense is potent, man. The dynamic and Cal Pitts is a cheat code. You know, Ty, you know Tyreek Hill is a cheat code at the NFL level. Cal Pitts is a cheat code at the college level. He's he is a matchup nightmare. Um, he's running slants against corners. <laughs> he's running away from safeties. Uh, that's going to be a problem if you're Tennessee, who simply cannot defend slant routes and throws in the middle of the football field. Uh, so I anticipate Florida to take advantage of that. You know, Dan Mullen, even though his Thanksgiving play looks disgusting, he's been great as a play caller. <laughs> um, I mean, he's been awesome, man. He's been freaking amazing as a play caller. I saw him just pick apart Georgia this year. Uh, and Georgia's defense, I thought at one point was the best in the country, but um, man, it's it's been it's been a rough, it's been a rough season for Tennessee fans, and I don't think a lot of people looking forward looking forward to this game. But uh, <laughs> even even with everyone playing, no one's looking forward to it. I don't think from you know from most of the Tennessee fans. But now you have the the contact tracing, which is not consistent in the SEC. Mm-hmm. The different cities and different counties have different you know policies and procedures in place. And for Tennessee, you know we got guys that have been out. 14 days, three different times. I mean, that's basically like five or six weeks, guys, have missed practice. And so that's hindered the development. A lot of young players that we thought would play early, they have not been able to play because they haven't had that practice time. And I understand Tennessee's not the only team that's, that's, that's dealing with this, but Tennessee definitely has been hit hard with the contact tracing and things like that. All right, so just to clear it up, Garantano or Garantano not going to play versus Florida? No, no, I don't, okay. think, I don't think so, man. Just I think he's part of that that group of guys that are contact tracing. You know, all right there. And I, I mean, look, I mean, there, there is a bright spot on, on this offense. I'm sure screen fans are screaming, run the ball, <laughs> especially when yes. it comes to uh, running back Eric Gray coming off his best performance in Tennessee's last game versus Auburn season high, 173 yards, 22 carries average 7.9 yards to carry 222 all purpose yards. I mean, he seems to, he seems to be that playmaker for the Vols offense. No, absolutely, man. You know, put the ball on the ground against Alabama, uh, put the ball on the ground in a different game. Um, but, man, other than that, he is a problem in the open sp- open field. You're not going to be able to tackle him one-on-one. He's going to make you miss. He has the ability to, 
change directions, put one foot in the ground, and not lose any speed at all. This offensive line, um, you know, they 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 really did a good job against Auburn running the football, um, and you know they haven't lived, lived up to expectations uh, from you know preseason and early in the season, but they are the strength of this football team and. Uh, they can provide some holes for Eric Gray and Ty Chandler. You know, Eric Gray and Ty Chandler just got to do a better job of of, of being able to break tackles and ab- absorb contact uh, and, and still fall forward and not be tackled, you know, uh, easily because it's just hard for this offense to get explosive plays because you're not really going to get it much in a passing game. Um, so the, the, all the pressure is on is on the run. All right, and there we'll move to the other side of the ball here with Jason Swain, former Tennessee wide receiver from 2003 to 2006 and host of the Swain event. We'll switch to the other side of the ball and finish up the, finish up there. You know, Big news this week, you kind of hit on it just a little bit, of course, but redshirt junior Kevon Bennett was dismissed from the team, leader in tackles for loss, co-leader in sacks for the team. How big of a loss is this? That's a big-time loss. A question for Tennessee heading into the season was, you know, pass rush. You lost Daryl Taylor to the draft. Um, and the biggest weakness that I saw on this team was the the front. And now you lose one of the guys that provides, you know, uh, pressure uh, to, for the quarterback. If you're going to have a chance against Kyle Trash, you got to get to him. Last year when Tennessee played Florida, Tennessee was able to force a turnover because they got to Kyle Trash. And um, if you don't do that, it's lights out. And Tennessee loses their, their best pass rusher, um, experienced player, and uh, it just t- it totally makes no sense to me why he put himself in that position. Uh, when you look at players that they get the cost of attendance now, so they get more money. You know, his his dad is up for the Hall of Fame. It's just man, it's just a really sad situation. Um, I mean, we've seen guys that come from nothing that feel like they gotta, you know, do those things, those mm-hmm. illegal activities to make ends meet. And I, you know, I understand it from a you know, certain perspective when it comes to that. But this is not that at all, man. This is a young man that didn't have to do that, but I guess decided to do it because it's look cool in a rap song or look cool from a movie. Just really, really disappointing, if you ask me. And I hear you there. And hey, look, I mean, another you know, stat that I was kind of maybe surprised to see here is balls have only given up eight passing touchdowns this season. And surprisingly, none of those were against Alabama. <laughs> so, you know, and that's the fewest allowed in the SEC. What's contributed to that output for the ball secondary? Man, that's a, that's a, Man, that's a real surprising stat, honestly, man, David. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, the pass rush has not been there. We've given quarterbacks the opportunity to throw the football and pick us apart. But I think I think part of it is, you know, besides Alabama, they haven't really played played a potent right. potent passing team, to be honest. I mean, um, you know, you played Bo Nix and Felipe Franks, and but we had and, and you did play Mac Jones, but you haven't played against Cal Trash yet. You haven't played against Kellamon yet. Um, and so he didn't play against Ole Miss. So I think I think that's that a little misleading. Yeah. Uh, you know, these DBs have had – they've not had the year that they were supposed to have. You know, last year they were one of the top teams in the SEC at interceptions. And I was looking for a big year out of those guys. But against Auburn, man, they had a huge bust. Uh, they gave up, you know, seven points to Anthony Schwartz. Um, it's, 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 it's been disappointing there on defense. And, you know – to have Alante Taylor out, to have Bryce Thompson possibly out, those are your two starting corners. Um, I don't, I don't anticipate Kyle Trask having any problem throwing the football down the field. I hear you. I hear you on that, Jason. Man, thank you so much for giving us a preview of these Tennessee Volunteers. And uh, um, you know, it, it stinks in a way with with the struggles because you know I think everybody likes these big time SEC atmospheres. In 2020, we weren't going to get that anyway, but you could still look toward the the big games and. Um, you know, the nineties are, 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 are far away from how, you know, fans feel about this. And I mean, look, uh, I've talked to Gator fans the last couple of years and, you know, kind of going through what you've discussed at the beginning of this interview. I mean, a lot of Gator fans of mine, you know, LSU is kind of past Tennessee as far as kind of like that third peg behind uh, Georgia and FSU, as far as the uh, rivalries go. Yeah, man. Yeah. Those rivalries right now, just not as strong as they were, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So I mean, hopefully we can do a better job of making this making this game more of a rivalry, but uh, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens, man. Uh, you just never done college football, so I appreciate you having me on today. I hope you guys featured on the My Bookie Turkey Day free play that allowed users to grab themselves a risk-free bet up to two hundred and fifty dollars. It was basically a free shot at trying to double your money. If you didn't get in on that, now is the time to get some skin in on the game with My Bookie. 
where odds boost, lightning deals, and free bets away all season long. The football season is far enough along now. We know who these teams are. We know what they're capable of, and it's not difficult to find some value in these lines. Whether you're a first-time customer or have been playing with my bookie for years, there is no shortage of value to be found in the thousands of game lines, unique prop bets, and contests that they offer every week. Sign up or get reloaded today. Find an edge, make your bet, and get paid. My bookie also boasts a fully-fledged casino platform, giving you access to all the classic table, slot, and card games you'd expect to find at your local spot. And the best part is, at my bookie, the doors never close, so you can continue to build your bankroll even after the stadium lots have gone out. Make the right play, sign up today at my bookie, and when you do, use promo code GATERS to get your deposit matched halfway, all the way up to a thousand bucks. Terms are simple. You put in two hundred dollars, they'll match that with another one hundred dollars into your account. If you were already planning to bet this season, this is free betting money. It's winning season at my bookie, so come join in on the fun and win some cash while you're at it. All right, here we go. We can look into the game a little bit more now. And you know, Tennessee, they're gonna have to run the ball <laughs> very well or hit a ton of deep explosive pass plays. That's their path to victory against Florida right here. Offensive numbers, man, I'm going to go down the list here. They are not good for this Tennessee offense. Like like Kentucky last week, they just cannot get it done on the offensive side of the ball. It's it's ugly. It's really, really, really ugly for what this uh, Tennessee offense is doing right now. Total offense, 106th in college football, 12th in the SEC at 339 yards a game. Scoring offense, 109th in college football, 11th in the SEC, only 20.1 points per game. Yards per play, 105th in college football, 11th in the SEC at 4.98 yards per play. Rushing offense, 74th, 7th in the SEC, 155 yards a game. Passing offense, 105th, 13th in the SEC at 184.3 yards per game passing and touchdown to interception ratio. Tennessee is 115th in the country, tied for 13th in the SEC, six touchdowns, seven interceptions. Oof, man, that's that's struggling there. Passing the ball, six touchdowns, <laughs> seven interceptions. And look, it's based off really Jarrett Garantano, not a good quarterback. No other way to say it. We've seen enough football played by him now, but Jeremy Pruitt keeps trotting him out there. You know, no development, no adjustments for him uh, or the other quarterbacks. And uh, this stat comes from Nathaniel Rutherford on Twitter. He used to cover Vols football. He's been on Gators Breakdown before, but in eight games versus SEC teams this season, Florida quarterback Kyle Trask has thrown for 34 passing touchdowns, only three interceptions. Jarek Garantano's Entire career versus SEC teams, 26 passing touchdowns, so eight less than Kyle Trask has this year, and 12 interceptions. Kyle Trask only has three this year. (laughs) In 29 total games for Jarrett Grantano. So just eight games for Kyle Trask, he has more games, he has more touchdowns than Jarrett Grantano has in his career versus SEC teams, eight more than Garantano has in his entire SEC career. And Garantano has thrown for nine more interceptions in his career than Trask, you know, just three this season. 29 games for Garantano, and that's the numbers there. Oof, that's bad. Look, he may not even get the, he may not even get the start. You heard what uh, Jason had to say uh, uh, about that. And, you know, Jeremy Pruitt did say that Harrison Bailey is going to play. He didn't say he would start on the uh, Wednesday SEC teleconference, but he did say Harrison Bailey would play versus the Gators, and a lot of people were thinking he'll get the start because Garantano uh, and the contact tracing there. So we'll see. We'll see where that goes. But uh, for Bailey, 14-23, to 175 yards and two touch two interceptions on the season. My bad. 14-23, 175 yards and two interceptions on the season for Bailey, uh, which, as you know, uh, for as bad as Garantano has been, they still haven't went to another quarterback to start games. <laughs> so I can't see confidence being too high uh, that, that Bailey is going to be any better here. 
About half his stats come in the Vols' last game versus Auburn. Bailey went 7-10 to 10 for 86 yards. He did lead, lead a touchdown drive that uh, the Vols scored on the ground. Uh, there they had two touchdowns in the game. That was one of them uh, when Bailey was the quarterback. His longest completion was 18 yards in that game. 24 yards is his longest on the season. Bailey didn't have an attempt pass, uh, pass attempt longer than 20 yards versus Auburn. He attempted two passes. Um, he didn't target anybody past 20 yards. Um, so he, he attempted uh, two passes, 20 yards versus Arkansas. One was completed for 24 yards. Uh, so, you know, they don't attempt as many deep passes with, with Bailey as, as compared to Garantano. Uh, they live and die with the deep ball when Garantano's in there. Uh, if he's not playing, this offense, to me, gets even more conservative. They don't go down the field as much with Bailey. And, you know, that, that means they'll lean more on the run game. And that's where Tennessee, you know, they, they got the weapon there. Uh, running back Eric Gray, more numbers on him. Going for over 100 yards rushing four times this season, including back-to-back games for the first time in his career. He's tied for uh, second in the SEC in that category. Uh Gray ranks fifth in the SEC in total rushing yardage with 651, fourth in yards per game at 93 yards per game, and tenth in rushing touchdowns with four. During the month of November, Gray averaged 148 yards per game on the ground. That led the SEC and ranked sixth in college football. Look, Tennessee's only going to keep this game close (laughs) if Gray can continue this trend. He's our leading receiver as well, tied with Josh Palmer, uh, wide receiver Josh Palmer with 22 catches. Uh, speaking of Palmer, he's the uh, wide receiver to watch here. Four touchdown catches on the year. Uh, so, but you look first part of this Florida game plan as far as who to stop. It's simply Eric Gray. So we need to see what we saw last week versus Kentucky. Of course, in the second half, uh, Tennessee doesn't have a whole lot of the the window dressing motion stuff that Kentucky likes to present. So play aggressive. Play with numbers in the box. Create havoc up front. Make plays on the ball. Uh, when Tennessee decides to go deep, you know, if they do, make some plays on the ball. If Florida needs to do that. You know, there will be some one-on-one matchups. The Tennessee can, can be competent in, in, in the run game. Uh, we can't see a repeat performance of the Arkansas game where guys are in position there to make plays on deep balls and get beat. <laughs> you know, if, uh, they found a way to get beat. So uh, I think this offense for Tennessee, you know, it, it falls right in favor, I think, with uh, – Todd Grantham and his style of defense with this terrible quarterback play. Florida's done a pretty good job against Tennessee the last couple of years uh, with, with, with this get with this Todd Grantham defense. Now the overall defense had been better as well, but the quarterback situation here just is going to eat Tennessee alive uh, here. So I think uh, I think it'd be a, a pretty good day for the Florida defense. Now onto the Tennessee defense it should be a big day for Trask and company and. Um, total defense, Tennessee is 61st in the country, 8th in the SEC in total defense, giving up 404 yards a game. Uh, look, the Florida defense gets hammered, but they are better than in every statistical category here than Tennessee. So for as bad as the Florida defense has looked, Tennessee's look worse. All these categories say it. Tennessee is 80th in the country and 11th in the SEC, giving up 31.3 points per game. 62nd and ninth, 62nd in the country, ninth in the SEC in rush defense, giving up 161 yards a game. I'll take that right now. <laughs> if Florida runs for 161 game, uh, yards th- this game, especially with what I think they're going to put up in the passing game. Uh, Tennessee, 79th in the country, sixth in the SEC, giving up 243 yards passing. Florida averages, averages 370 yards passing a game, almost 130 yards more on average for the skater passing game than what Tennessee gives up on average. Tennessee gave up to Mac Jones, Alabama's quarterback, 25 of 31, 387 yards. Trask will have a big day. <laughs> as long as he has the time, of course. Go back to, you know, can the offensive line, in particular Gina Lance, start better. Start better. Give Trask enough time early in the game to put up some points early. It's time to start tuning up for the SEC championship game. Go out there, get off to a, a, a fast start. I know it's probably going to be cold. I don't think it's going to be as cold as what they initially thought. I don't think Florida's going to have to deal with any snow. The game's at 3.30, so the beginning of the game will be a little warmer uh, than, than, than the rest. So I think go out there, put some points up early as you feel comfortable in the mid-40s is what it's looking like weather. That's not too bad. 
Florida boy like me don't like it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, for these football players, you know, they'll, they'll be out there, should be ready to go with that 330 kick there. And then, look, Tennessee's losing their best pass rusher. You heard us talk about that earlier. Take advantage early. Attack this Tennessee defense down the field, bust their zone coverage, uh, much like Trask did last year uh, there. So this was Trask's first start last year in the, in the swamp. Uh, I remember that big-time uh, touchdown pass uh, catch that Kyle Pitts made uh, versus Tennessee last year. So, I mean, look, Tennessee also – Ranked 116th nationally in third down defense. 116th nationally. That is awful. Awful. Allowing opponents to convert exactly 50% of their third down opportunities on the season. 12th in the SEC defensively on third down. 116th nationally. 12th in the SEC. Every opponent Tennessee has faced the past five games, all those losses, five games in a row here, has converted at least 50% of the time on third down. It lines up for Florida to put up some points here. <laughs> I'm telling you, losing their best pass rusher, an awful third down uh, defense. And they haven't played, you know, Dan Mullen has owned Jeremy Pruitt the last couple of years as well. So lines up for me, 47-13 victory for the Gators. I think it's a complete performance for Florida this week. Florida hasn't matched my total uh, as far as points scored in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I think that gets fixed here. The, long, you know, this is really still to me these last couple games, still more about Florida than it is the opponent. Go out there, get off to a fast start, and go out there and just uh, you know put up some points, put up some points, put up some points. And I, I think we'll see it here as uh, they got a forty-seven thirteen Gators victory run game. Yeah, you know, I didn't talk much about it. It, it is it is kind of just what it is. Florida's a passing team. I think we just kind of. Concentrate there <laughs> for, for this moment. Uh, I think, you know, the, the third down stat uh, I gave for Tennessee there, I think it lends itself if Florida's in some short yardage situations to go out there and convert some short yardage situations on the ground. But, you know, this isn't uh, this is uh, an offense, I think, that's going to have to fine-tune itself for the SEC championship game. You're going to go out there. I mean, if Florida gets up big, I think you can see the run game take over in the second half like they tried to work on last week. It's kind of kind of how I see it going, honestly, when uh, you're looking at the – how this, Florida run game and how it may get some opportunities in this game. I don't think Florida, Florida's not going to come out and try and establish the run game early on. I, I don't think so. Maybe because of the cold weather. Maybe, maybe because of that, but I'm still not, still not completely sure uh, on, on that part of it. So yeah, um, kind of going to skip uh, your guys' thoughts. They're just kind of getting repeated every week now of what we want to see. I'll probably hop on Periscope Thursday or fr- probably Friday. Uh, we can kind of talk about you know that part of it uh, there. I'll do that usually when I leave it out of the episode part. I'll get on Periscope to have some interaction with you guys uh, to kind of you know get a feel for your thoughts on the game and stuff. But every kind of week is kind of falling into the same. Um, Want to see better play from the defense? Want to see lined up? Want to you know? It's just kind of been the same thing. So uh, we'll uh, we'll skip that part this week and see and see where it goes. Uh, but uh, it was kind of getting repetitive there. So you know, not, not 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 your fault, guys. It's just it is what it is. You know, we all want to see the kind of the same thing uh, here uh, right now. So we'll, we'll uh, I'll, I'll I'll try to hop on Periscope sometime Friday if you can join me live around lunchtime. I think that's when I'll probably do it. And then if not, uh, just watch the replay. I'll definitely post it uh, there on the social media, uh, mainly Twitter there. So here we go. SEC schedule for this week. Texas A&M, Auburn. Can Auburn bounce back from the blasting they took from Alabama last week? Texas A&M, can they continue to um, you know, play well enough to stay in that five spot there in college football playoff rankings? Uh, had some you know trouble, I, I guess a little trouble at LSU last week. And you know, it didn't blow them out. They kind of who hummed their way through that game to kind of keep it closer than it probably should have been. But AM, Auburn, 12 o'clock, ESPN, Arkansas, Missouri, also at noon on the SEC network. So, uh, Missouri, no winning record right now, four and three. Uh, those Tigers are Arkansas. We'll see if they can kind of continue their trend. That's a, that's a pretty good game, I think. Arkansas, Missouri, there. Florida, Tennessee, of course, 3 30. Uh, and then 30 minutes later, Vanderbilt, Georgia. Vanderbilt uh, not fired Derek Mason this week. Uh, you know, Georgia went crazy in the run game versus South Carolina last week. Uh, you probably see more uh, of the same there. Not sure. You know, it's not going to be much of a game. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. Vanderbilt, Georgia. Uh, it is. That's one of those. It is what it is type of games. You can 
I mean, glad that game comes on the same time as Florida. I mean, you won't, we won't really have to pay much attention uh, to, to that one there. South Carolina, Kentucky, 730 SEC Network. Um, of course, we know Carolina's issues there. Kentucky played Florida last week. We'll see how they bounce back. That's a game that really yeah, that's not worth uh, – you know, there's a reason that game's on at the same time as Alabama and LSU. <laughs> that game, 730 SEC Network, Carolina, Kentucky. But Alabama, LSU, of course, 8 o'clock, not cap on CBS. Um, not a really great slate this week, you know, especially when your 8 o'clock CBS game is Alabama and LSU. Uh, not the same LSU team, nowhere near it. Opt-outs galore. Uh, continuing to happen throughout the season for LSU, Alabama. They're trying to fine-tune themselves as well, uh, getting ready for Florida in the SEC Championship game uh, more than likely. Alabama-Florida win this week. It will be official. Those two teams will be playing in the SEC Championship game, uh, but they both have to win uh, this week, and it won't matter what anybody else does. So we'll see how it goes there. Both the uh, you know SEC division leaders on CBS this week, Florida at 3.30 against Tennessee and Alabama against LSU at 8 o'clock. All right, let's do it. For this episode of Gators Breakdown, I'm your host, David Waters. Thank you for joining me. You can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thanks for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown.